Welcome to Airheads. Coming up, pellets on parade, so many to choose from, but which ones do you go for? We have practical range finding, a whopping Ratzilla, and a new series from Charlie revisiting great historic shots using air guns. First, a best bait test. James Marchington has turned his back garden into a research facility to find out what works. Well, last time I had some success baiting in crows and magpies using eggs from the ducks. So that set me thinking, I wonder what bait would really work? What do they really get attracted to? Well, this time of year, of course, they're nesting. So I thought, well, maybe some nice nesting materials would appeal. So where do you find nesting materials? In the Hoover bag. Now this stuff's pretty nasty, but there's plenty of dog hair in there and it should appeal to the birds. Pulled out a good wadge and stuck it underneath some chicken wire so it'll hold it down set the trail camera up and left it overnight to catch whatever comes first thing in the morning. Well, during the night, of course, the old Labrador came sniffing around and that's what she thought of it. Oh well. But first thing in the morning, along comes this chap and close behind him, here comes the crow. He's loving that, he's getting a real beakful. Well, nesting material certainly seems to work, but what about other times of year when they're not building nests? The obvious thing's food, but what's going to appeal to them most? There's only one way to find out, and that's do a bit of an experiment. So I've got a couple of those eggs that they like so much, a slice of bread, and a tin of pedigree chum. Laid them all out in a line, stand back, see what happens. Didn't take long for the crow to spot that. And down he comes. What's he gonna go for? Is it the eggs? The bread? It's the pedigree chum. Well, fancy that. He's really tucking in. And here's his mate, come for a mouthful as well. They're quite scared of that tin, but that's not gonna stop them. Look at the size of that beak. It's no wonder they can do so much damage to songbirds and livestock like lambs and things. They still like the egg and they're even interested in the bread, but it's the pedigree chum that's really got them going. So what do you think of that, Mr. Crow? So that proves it then. If you want to attract crows, this is the stuff. Pedigree chum. I wonder if they'll give me a job advertising it. Great shots there, James. Now, from a tasty morsel, we're going to a very stale one. Over to David with hot air. This is Hot Air. BSA Guns UK has launched its new UK website. It'll be used to showcase news about upcoming models, what's on at the BSA factory and general updates. Visit bsaguns.co.uk. One of the biggest air guns in the world may wipe out the endangered right whale. Atlantic oil drilling uses seismic air guns which deliver powerful blasts of compressed air that travel through water striking the ocean floor. Wildlife conservation groups, however, are fighting this technique, saying the animals in the marine environment should not be exposed to the effects of blasts. A US school teacher has been busted for bringing an air rifle into class. 53-year-old high school teacher Vilma Lataladi was arrested for bringing the air gun and a toy gun into her Brooklyn school to use as a teaching aid. 
And finally, a giant rat caught in a kitchen in Stockholm has wowed the world's newspapers. Dubbed Ratzilla, it measures nearly 16 inches without its tail. Pest controllers killed it using an oversized trap. Even the family cat had refused to enter the kitchen while the giant rat was in residence. You are now to date with Hot Air. Aiming for accuracy, targeting the truth. Thank you for that one, David. Now that was one huge rat. I am certainly never going to Sweden after seeing that. As we know, air gunning requires precise range finding. Now we're off to Tony Bielis to give us some tips on how to do it best. With a 12 foot pound air rifle, really the pellet is flat between 15 and really 30, 35. It starts to drop at 35. And that is usually what we describe as the effective range of a 177 air rifle, 35 yards. So I have the scope set at 27 yards. And from my HFT experience, I know on uh, 10 power, it's clear from around 10 yards out to probably 40, 42 yards and then it starts to lose its focus quite quickly. So I know, depending on the blurriness of the target, pretty much what the range is, because 35 yards are still going to be sharp, or whether it's getting towards the edge of my effective range. Unless, of course, I'm shooting from a hide. With a hide, I can prepare myself, so I have three range finders. By far the most accurate is my 50 meter tape measure, but always not always the most practical. But it does work and you can actually measure out, particularly if you're going back to the same point time and time again. You can actually peg out different ranges or make mental notes or even do yourself a range card where you can put posts, 25 yards, poplar tree, 35 yards, etc. onto your uh, range marker. And you could use a simple tape measure. Um, up here in Cumbria, you're likely to disappear into a bog and never to be seen again if you use this. So I also have a couple of range finders. I have an MTC and a Bushnell, like both. Um, I have two because I have two and inevitably one of them has a flat battery and you just pick up the other one. And I can range find known objects very quickly. So if I'm in a high position like we were yesterday, where I've never been to before, I can, I'm not too worried about the short stuff, but I can actually go to trees a little bit further out and get my 45 and even 50 yard shots range found. So if something happened over there, I would know and I'd know exactly where to put the scope. You might not be prepared to take that shot until 35 yards, but if you know that the squirrel is currently at 50, it helps you get ready for it. Next, Air Gun Centre's Peter Zamet is looking at the extras. Modern air rifles nowadays don't actually come, not very many of them anyway, with open sights. So there are some additional bits of kit that you need to actually get cracking. Basically, your base spring rifle, you're going to need one of these things, a telescopic sight, um, with a set of mounts to bolt on the top. Um, these things, they start from sort of 60, 70 pounds upwards, and something like this is a middle of the range, um, 120 pounds, something like that. Ideally, if you're out and about, you're going to need a case, um, something like this, 30 to 50 pounds, something suitable for all rifles come in various lengths so you get the right sort of length for your rifle um, and then last but not least on the on the bare essentials you're going to need a tin of pellets um, there's 500 these are 177 air arms pellets something like that 500 bangs is going to set you back about eight quid nine pounds something like that so tremendous value for money if you're then going into slightly more serious kit you buy yourself a pre-charged rifle you're going to need a method of filling the rifle um, especially if you're going to shoot it in your garden. Um, you're going to need to be sort of self-contained, self-sufficient. You're going to need either a filling kit, this is a 3 litre 300 bar bottle, or the other option is the Hills Pump. This is quite a lot of hard work, but it's lovely because you are actually self-contained with this thing. And you can pump up most pre-charged rifles from empty with this in less than five minutes. Once this is empty, um, you generally charge five pounds to fill it, and a bottle of this size, um, 300 bar, three litre, is going to give you around about 2,000 shots worth of air. Some other little luxury add-on items, once you get more involved into the sport, if you're shooting rabbits with a, with a lamp, um, this is a self-contained um, lead lenser lamp, another luxury 
gadget that we sell quite a lot of these days um, is your, your laser range finder. Tripod, bipod or monopod. The bipod that fixes on the rifle. There are some really, really good and effective add-ons once you get involved in the sport. Pellets, like humans, come in all shapes and sizes, some better than others. Now we're off with Air Gunner and Air Gun World's technical editor, Phil Price, to have a look at some of the more weird examples. I've been shooting air guns for well over 30 years and one of the things that's always really fascinated me has been pellets and from there even the whole thing about ballistics, trajectory, windage, retained energy, the whole thing. Every now and then you get some fantastic new idea comes along and it seems really, really clever and really exciting but I've got some bad news and the news is they don't work. I've tried everything, every single pellet that's ever come along in my 30 year shooting career I've tried them all. In fact, I've got a shelf in my study that I think is going to end up going through the floor quite soon. There must be over 250 tins of pellets in there. Strange pointed ones, multi-ring ones, ones with balls set into them, weird and wonderful shapes, and they just don't work. The simple truth is, the best pellets you can buy are simple, well-made round head pellets. If you go to a, a field target competition or an HFT competition, you'll find everybody shooting high quality round heads. And if you need to know what works well in your gun, buy a few tins of really top quality ones, um, Air Arms Field, H&M Field Target Trophy, Crossman Premier, those key ones and try them. Find the one that's most accurate in your gun and you will be well off. Thank you for that one, Phil. Now, somebody else to talk tech with. Charlie has been off doing the maths and is recreating history with air guns. Great shots this week, recreating remarkable historic ballistics with air guns looks at one of the great tragedies of the Second World War. Commissioned in 1920, HMS Hood was the pride of the Royal Navy and of Britain. At the outbreak of war, she worked knocking out blockade runners between Iceland and the Norwegian Sea. She took part in the destruction of the French fleet at Mers el Kabir and in May 1941 was sent to hunt down the Bismarck and the Prince Eugen. Bismarck hit the hood with its fifth salvo at a range of 16,650 metres, just over 10 miles. This is a contemporary film from one of the German ships. Hood sank with 1,418 men aboard only three British sailors survived. The 15-inch shells hit one or more of the aft magazines. The Admiralty communique called it an unlucky hit. So let's look at how difficult it is. The Bismarck's guns had a range of up to 35 miles, though the shells that hit Hood are more likely to have been larger, weighing up to 1,800 pounds. Still, Bismarck could launch something weighing almost a tonne up to 22 miles at a muzzle velocity of 2,700 feet per second. My GAT air gun has a muzzle velocity of just 200 feet per second. Its maximum range is 43 feet and 6 inches, which I've discovered by firing it at various angles and measuring the distance. The best elevation or cant to get that maximum distance is 25 degrees. Best elevation for maximum range is usually between 20 and 33 degrees. Why not 45 degrees? I'll need a tennis racket to explain that. There are several reasons why 45 degrees is not the best angle for maximum range. One is the drag force of air resistance. So a pellet may spend longer in the air at 45 degrees, but travel further at 30 degrees. Another is Magnus force, which comes from a pellet spinning. It acts at right angles to both the path of the pellet and to the rotation axis, which is why when you hit a ball with backspin, it goes up and when you hit a ball with topspin, it goes down faster than when you hit it straight. Back to HMS Hood. I'm going to have it sailing towards me, expecting to engage and destroy me. Now, the original projectile that hit it weighed about 230,000 times as much as this cork and could travel 2,670 times as far. 
I'm going to use the scale of the maximum range of the cork versus the shell to take this shot at 20 feet 5 inches and see if I can land a cork towards its stern. OK, so first of all we need to work out the angle. So to do that we use the patent Jacobi protractometer. Do you reckon that's about right? Yep. Good. Right, fire in the hold. Let her go. Oh, not bad. Went slightly beyond HMS Hood. I mean, in uh, original naval terms, that was about 15 miles, that shell. Now, I'm going to increase the uh, angle using the... Uh, about five degrees. Yeah, do you think five or do you think more? I think we'll start with five. OK, we're going to get to 50 degrees. Safe to catch. Off. And fire. Oh, no, still about 13 miles, I think. We're going to have to put, I think we're going to have to add another 10 degrees. OK. OK, fire when you're ready. Ooh. Yes! <laughs> well, I think we'll call that close enough. Thanks, Charlie. Next up, we are with his lordship. We're off with Ted. What's up, Big T? Talk inches to me. What size groups should I achieve before going hunting with my air rifle? Three quarters of an inch. Three quarter inch means that your weapon is reliable. And I'm not gonna ever tell some kid you gotta be shooting quarter inch groups at 20 years. His spring gun isn't gonna do it and his skill set isn't gonna do it. So what am I gonna do? Tell him not to go out pest controlling until he can achieve the levels that, you know, a, 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 at least a, a modestly good shooter could do? No. I know I couldn't do half inch groups at that age. And I went out anyway. So once again, Charlie, we're back to the exact same place where I have to say, do I have the right to judge some kid for doing something that I was incapable of doing at that age too? Three quarter inch groups at 20 yards, you got your act together, go out and shoot something. Fantastic once again. Here are a few more reasons to stay watching YouTube. We're off with air streaming. Charlie Jacoby here. This is my weekly roundup of the best air gunning on YouTube. Let's start foreign. Bone Collector Squirrel Hunt with Gamo Bull Whisper BC Edition has a bunch of Americans with a Spanish air gun out after squirrels. They have a bag limit. Guys, come to the UK and shoot some of ours. Free man shooting offers air rifle magpie shot at 156 yards. He suffers a bit from negative comments, but he copes and this video proves that if you are capable of taking the shot, then take the shot. Viewer Dragon of the East Blue recommends a film from Mr. FIR Guy 5. It's been a while since he uploaded a film. This one, Air Rifle Pesting Hash 20, shows what happens to birds that fly into his yard. Back to Blighty and its Operation Maiden Voyage. In this episode of VHTV, Cy and Davy get given a green light on a top secret mission to take on the evil Rat Queen Soldier Rats. Their words, not mine. Now a useful how to film. Air gun regulator fixing slow atmospheric breathe hole leaks shows how to clean your reservoir before fitting a regulator. The Air Gun Center has put up a series of gun review films and here is one of them about the FX Verminator Mark II. It is a gladiator on a diet, they conclude. I like their sense of humour. Hunter's Vermin offers his Armex Airstream pellet test. He is trying them out at the British Shooting Show in February. And finally, International Man of Mystery, the Jack Ryan of air gunning. Special Agent T. Holdover is at German Shooting Sports Trade Show EWA where he reviews the Daystate Wolverine highlight in 303. Hey Ted, you should have said. Click on the links to watch the videos or you will find them in this film's description. If you would like to send in a video for air streaming, ping me the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Sadly, that's the end of the show for this week. We'll be back in two weeks. Catch up with you then. Know.